Hello, you're listening to the My Care Champion Cast. I'm your host, Lucy Shimatero of the Michigan Health and Hospital Association. Each month, we invite industry experts and thought leaders to discuss relevant healthcare issues. Join us as we explore key topics that affect Michigan hospitals, health systems, and the health of our communities. Hello, and welcome back to the My Care Champion Cast. I'm Lucy Shimatero, Assistant Director of Communications at the Michigan Health and Hospital Association. For those who don't know, September is National Recovery Month. Over the last decade, opioid use disorder has risen exponentially across the state and country. In 2022 alone, there were more than 21,000 overdose cases reported in Michigan emergency rooms, and sadly, more than 2,600 overdose deaths. This impacts people at all walks of life, across all communities, and worsens existing health disparities and inequities. National Recovery Month is about uplifting the resources and treatment opportunities that can help those battling a substance use disorder. One of the tools that continues to be impactful in this space is Medication for Opioid Use Disorder, or MOUD. This pathway to recovery involves medications that relieve withdrawal symptoms and substance cravings. In many cases, MOUD treatment is paired with interventions like counseling or peer support so that a person is able to better address the social and psychological factors that influence recovery. I'm joined by two very special guests who will share more about an initiative in Michigan hospitals that brings MOUD programming to the emergency room. The first guest I'll introduce is Michelle Norcross, MSA, who is Senior Director of Safety and Quality at the MHA Keystone Center. Over the course of her career, spanning nearly two decades, Michelle has been an instrumental thought leader in healthcare safety and quality efforts with a focus on opioid stewardship and patient engagement. Michelle, thanks for joining me today. Thanks so much for having me. In addition to Michelle, I have Marissa Natsky, who is Senior Project Manager of Health and Human Services at the Community Foundation for Southeast Michigan, also referred to as CFSEM. She manages the foundation's health projects and provides subject matter expertise in health, substance use disorder, and nutrition. Marissa holds a Master of Public Health from the University of Michigan and is a registered dietitian. Marissa, thanks for being here as well. Thank you. Excited to be here. Well, I know I provided a bit of an intro for both of you, but I'd love if you could take some time just to share a little bit more about your positions and also the organizations that you come from. Uh, Michelle, obviously, we've had guests from Keystone on the podcast before, but maybe you can kick us off by sharing a little bit more about your position and tie to this work. Yeah, certainly. So as you shared, I'm the Senior Director of Safety and Quality and over the MHA Keystone Center. And really, I would describe the MHA Keystone Center as the quality and safety arm of the Michigan Health and Hospital Association. So what we do is we work to really bring together hospitals and members of their team to voluntarily participate in programs that improve both safety and quality of healthcare. So all of our efforts that we work to implement are evidence-based, best practices, they're supported by data, and it really allows the hospitals and their healthcare organizations to see improvements on those safety and quality outcomes. Um, So over the last several years, the Keystone Center has been really focused heavily on behavioral health initiatives. And so I'm really excited to talk today a little bit more about one of my passions, substance use disorder, and what we're doing to try to make a larger impact across the state of Michigan. Absolutely. That's amazing. And I am so grateful that you're here. Um, We haven't worked very closely in the past, so it's nice to have this opportunity to sit down with you. Um, And for anyone that's listening and isn't familiar, we may throughout the episode refer to substance use disorder as SUD. So I just want to call that out sooner than later. Um, Marissa, I I know we had a chance to meet before this record, but uh, if you can tell us a little bit more about your role and also about CFSEM for those who may not be familiar, that'd be great. Yeah, absolutely. Um, So yeah, like you mentioned, um, I'm a senior project manager on the health and human service team at the Community Foundation. And so for those of you who might not be as familiar, CFSEM is a philanthropic organization and um, a permanent community endowment. It's built by gifts from thousands of individuals and organizations. The foundation supports a variety of activities, including education, arts and culture, um, health, human services, community development, civic affairs, and really focuses on Wayne, Oakland, Macomb, Monroe, Washtenaw, St. Clair, and Livingston counties. But the Community Foundation is also home to the Michigan Opioid Partnership, or the MOP, as we refer to it. And the MOP is a public-private collaborative that includes the state of Michigan and then other key philanthropic organizations as well. And everyone has a shared goal of decreasing opioid overdoses and deaths. The MOP itself was formed in 2017 and supports different initiatives 
like prevention, treatment, harm reduction, um, and sustaining recovery. And uh, to date, the MOP has granted over $6 million and supported hospitals, county jails, community foundations, and other nonprofits to increase harm reduction, post-overdose rapid response, and treatment services. And we can talk a little bit more about each of those later. But the primary focus really has been on uh, increasing access to, to MOUD over the last few years. That's amazing. And you did start as a registered dietitian and then found your way into this area of work. So what was the journey of sort of merging those two areas of expertise? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, I get it a lot. Um, Mm -hmm. I think it's just interest and and, and a passion. Um, Yeah, I started really as a dietitian in the food insecurity and hunger space. And then I think, you know, throughout my dietetic internship, throughout my first couple of roles in the community, I think that you kind of, you see SUD bleed into so much and it just kind of started to build this, this like separate additional passion um, that I wanted to explore too. And so there wasn't really a clear path, um, but yeah, yeah, it's been really exciting learning about this area as well and being able to pull on my public health background a bit more. Right. That's great. Well, I think it's really valuable to have each of you in your respective areas of expertise weigh in on this conversation Um, And I obviously kick things off with a pretty alarming stat that we have seen more than 21,000 overdose cases in Michigan emergency rooms, and that was just in 2022. Um, And that stat doesn't even give the full picture because I think it was only representative of about 10 months out of the year. So it's pretty astounding. Um, I know that I relate to this issue on a personal level. I think we all know someone who's affected by substance use disorder. Uh, Michelle, can you kick us off just by sharing what the role of hospitals and health systems are in creating paths to recovery for for those who may be struggling with substance use disorder. Yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, we're really fortunate in a way that emergency departments really are the critical intervention points, if you will, for those that are having an overdose, for example, that might be coming into the emergency department. So oftentimes, hospitals are some of the first places that persons with opioid use disorder actually go in and might be able to seek treatment. And so that really uniquely positions us not only to administer immediate intervention, but also connect them with resources and programs to support their sustained recovery. Um, I, you know, I'd, I'd love to talk a little bit more uh, maybe in, in later in this uh, conversation about the peer recovery support services that some of our hospitals are starting to implement that really allows for a more personalized approach to recovery. Right. And to your point, there are so many factors that play into treatment and recovery. It's not just about a physical dependence and getting over that hurdle. Um, It's also about the social and behavioral uh, factors that come to play. So I appreciate you calling that out. And we definitely will talk more about it throughout the episode. But Marissa, what would you say is really important about involving hospitals and health systems in this work? There, there's a handful of things that come to mind. And one is actually uh, like a financial a financial reason. Um, so when you think of the cost savings that can occur through this work, specifically through MOUD and the emergency department, we know that OUD patients tend to have more admissions, more readmissions, longer lengths of stay than the general population. And we also know that MOUD is very cost effective and reuse, reduces the utilization of emergency departments. And so there's actually evidence that shows that there's a pretty significant cost savings associated with making sure that folks have access to evidence-based treatment and care. Right. I think that's a very important point to call out. And it's not just a benefit to patients battling substance use disorder. It's a benefit to hospitals and health systems too. So um, can you speak a little bit more about what exactly the EDMOUD program is and how this partnership with Keystone and Michelle's team came to be? Absolutely. Um, So it's a federally funded project um, led by the Michigan Opioid Partnership and, again, MHA Keystone Center and the Community Foundation. The goal is really to increase access, again, to MOUD and emergency departments and then improve that connection to follow-up care into the community once folks leave the emergency department or the hospital. The way the initiative has been set up, it's it's two pieces. It's kind of like two components. Um, the one is a grant project program, and the other one is a technical assistance program. Every hospital in Michigan is eligible to participate in our technical assistance. We have a team of clinical providers that we work with, um, champions who have done this work in their emergency departments in Michigan, who can provide one-on-one technical assistance. And then the grant program really asks that hospitals follow a work plan that involves identifying patients when they enter the ED, 
to make sure we know who has opioid use disorder, and then making sure that there are protocols in place to offer medication if it's, if it's appropriate and if patients are interested, and then um, making sure, again, that there's that connection to follow-up care when they, when they leave the emergency department. The connection with MHA Keystone Center has been really exciting and really crucial um, because of the relationship with all of the hospitals in the state. So we've seen a really, a really stark growth um, in participation in the initiative over the last few years. So the first grant that we made um, for this work started in 2019, and I think we had a, five or six hospitals that first year. And um, as of today, we've worked with half of the hospitals, uh, the emergency departments in the state, which is 75 emergency departments. And a lot of that growth is due to the engagement um, that came about by working with the Keystone Center, really promoting this work um, to hospitals, encouraging them to participate, outreach, um, that sort of thing, helping us with evidence-based trainings has, has been really great. I mean, the fact that you've had so many hospitals adopt the programming really speaks volumes about how important and impactful it is. So Michelle, do you have any examples, or Marissa, either of you, any examples of what the impact has been and specifically what the journey, um, I know it was touched on a little bit earlier, but a little bit more in the specifics of what this can look like for a patient who's looking to take a path to recovery. Yeah, so for the EDMOUD program um, as a whole, I think, you know, it's really important when patients come in that they're able to seek that treatment immediately and have it be identified that they do have opioid use disorder or substance use disorder mm -hmm. um, and have access to medications such as methadone or buprenorphine, naltrexone, right. um, and and. That alone, you know, having that access will work to increase the outcomes um, for them to be able to sustainably recover. Mm -hmm. Additionally, with the use of peer recovery support services, that really allows people to have that personalized recovery. So peer recovery support services, for those that aren't familiar with that term, are those that previously, you know, had a substance use disorder that are actively in recovery. Um, and so they have lived experience. And I think there's nothing that you know, a, a physician or a nurse would be able to say to somebody who's in that moment, right? And it might be in in one of the m worst moments of their life, per you know, perhaps they just overdosed, mm -hmm. that they can say to, to say, I understand what you're going to going through right in this moment. However, a peer recovery support specialist has specialist has lived that, right? They right. have been there. They understand, you know, the programs that are available. They understand that the path to recovery might not look the same for everybody. And that mm -hmm. that means, right, that using opioid use disorder medications for opioid use disorder might be right for somebody, but a step program might be something that somebody else prefers, um, where, you know, somebody might want to tap in more spiritually or they need different resources to get into safer housing, for example, um, and recovery support housing. So a peer recovery support specialist will really work to identify what is the most important facet for the person who's in front of them and work to figure out what program is going to work best for them. Mm -hmm. And I think that's really critically important to make sure that they have a recovery plan that works for them. It's not cookie cutter. And so having that personalized plan, treating them as an individual, letting them be seen and heard and having input in their own care is so critically important to the success. Yeah. I mean, like any or many healthcare issues, it, it's certainly not a one size fits all approach to treatment and recovery. So I appreciate you calling that out. And um, Marissa, I know you said this earlier, but a lot of the readmissions that EDC are by people who are struggling with substance use disorder and that journey is not linear. So I want to make sure that's that's clear in this conversation. Um, and, and I want to also touch on later the shame and stigma that may come with that and how this programming is is kind of tackling that aspect of things too. Uh, Michelle, I am curious when you say there's a peer recovery support, uh, is that in the ED or is that after the patient is discharged? Uh, where in the programming does that come to play? Yeah, so not all of the hospitals have them, but several of them do. And right now we're really working 
with the state of Michigan to see if we can have this covered um, as a service through insurance. And so that's something that we're actively pushing. We feel that it's critically important. Um, some of our hospitals have had the ability through grants and other programs to be able to implement these really important and honestly necessary um, individuals within their communities. And so it is a service that's available in the emergency department. Um, there's also some that are available through community-based services, through community mental health as well. Um, so we, we know that there are some that are out there in the field. Our hope and our desire is that we can get more out there and in the field mm -hmm. because we know how critically important it is to the success of, of, of this program and uh, frankly making sure that we can have these these individuals have a program that they feel comfortable with in their, their course of plan. Yeah, I think collaboration is so huge to the success of programs like this, um, which is why this partnership is really so special. And I'm so grateful to be speaking to both of you to get both perspectives. Marissa, is there anything you'd add about the partnership in general um, and what the process would look like for someone who's entering the ED with opioid use disorder? No, just to, just to add on about, um, you know, Michelle's comments about peer recovery coaches is that that warm handoff we piece of the work. Um, so again, handing folks off um, to outpatient care in the community, whatever that might look like, whether that's you know medication-based treatment in an outpatient facility, whether that's harm reduction services, whatever the patient is interested in and is ready for, takes a lot of time. And we know providers are just very, very busy um, in the emergency department. And so just even from like a logistical standpoint, it is so important to have someone who not only has the lived experience, but has the time dedicated in their day to do this work and help patients sit on the phone and get appointments mm -hmm. and um, talk them through the process. So Right. And to your point about advocates, I think that's so hugely important, not only because it helps the patient feel safe and heard, but it also helps address some of the shame and stigma that is often associated with battling a substance use disorder. That is unfortunately the case for so many people that are struggling both inside and outside of the hospital setting. Um, and I know this programming is, is trying to address some of that. So, Michelle, can you touch on what exactly, you know, we're doing to address stigma and also just maybe share some of the stigmas that are associated with substance use disorder and medication for opioid use disorder? Yeah, absolutely. I, I think stigma significantly affects this patient population more so than than any other disease that I can think of, frankly. Mm -hmm. And it's disheartening. It's really disheartening that people believe that a medical condition is a moral failing. Right. And I think if you think about, you know, other diseases such as diabetes, you would never consider that a moral failing of somebody, mm -hmm. but yet they do consider that for somebody that has substance use disorder. And additionally, they think that if they start something such as medications for opioid use disorder, that they're trading one substance for another. And that's not the case. This is a prescription medication. It's controlled. It's, you know, needs to be written by a provider and... Right. You are medically observed, right? It's this is this is a completely clinical condition. It's diagnosable. And so I think it's important for us to call that out because substance use disorder is not a moral failing. Genuinely, it's not. Right. And, you know, I, I can't say much other than that. Um, but it takes it takes a long time for people to understand that. And it also takes a long time for individuals to understand that you can't look at somebody and say they have substance use disorder or they have opioid use disorder. Just like you most of the time can't look at somebody and go, oh, they're a diabetic, right? Or, oh, they have heart failure. You, you're not going to know that by just looking at some somebody. And so... There's this perception that if you offer MOUD services in your community, that all of a sudden everybody in the community is going to just rush or other communities will rush to that location for treatment. And that's not the case. You're seeing these patients every single day. They are already part of your community. You just might not recognize that they're part of your community. And so it's really important to make sure that we are offering these services and we're not stigmatizing patients so that they are able to get the treatment that they deserve. And so, you know, again, I think it's about humanizing 
substance use disorder and ensuring that people understand, again, it's not a moral failing. Absolutely. I couldn't agree more. Marissa, is there anything you'd add there? I guess I would say that the stigma associated with opioid use disorder definitely it results in just unnecessarily complex and difficult to navigate situations um, for patients. Folks like you, like you mentioned, Lucy, will avoid seeking care, avoid seeking treatment. Um, mm-hmm. I do think it's important to take it a step further and consider how stigma intersects with other identities as well, compounded by marginalization linked to race, gender, ethnicity, socioeconomic status, age, sexual orientation. And we know in Michigan specifically, we know that it's really important to talk about how OUD-related stigma intersects with race. Um, and so a couple of the, you know, the statistics that we like to highlight pretty frequently are that in 2018, the overall overdose death rate actually decreased slightly across the state, about 3%. We, at the same time, we actually saw an increase among Black residents of about 20%. We also know that Black residents comprise about 14% of Michigan's population, but they account for 21% of the opioid um, overdose deaths. Thinking of that um, and keeping that in mind and what does that mean, because I don't think we can talk about, you know, stigma associated with OUD without also bringing up racial disparities and um, what trainings are required or how we tackle that as well. Right. Absolutely. I think those are really important statistics to call out. Uh, And I know hospitals and health systems are probably more focused than they've ever been on applying a health equity lens to the work that they do. And this programming doesn't sound like it's any exception to that. So I appreciate uh, you sharing that. And also, I'm curious if there's a part of the program that focuses on educating healthcare workers about things like stigma or unconscious bias or calls out the fact that there are many barriers and gaps in care for Black patients in comparison to their white counterparts. What does that education piece look like? In terms of our programming, part of what we ask hospitals to do is make sure that their providers are trained. And trained not just in how to prescribe medication, but trained in how to talk to this population, what language to use, um, what language is considered stigmatizing, um, how to approach patients about um, their substance use, that sort of thing. To my point earlier, a gap that we noticed, one of our really um, really important key partners in this work is Vital Strategies. And they partnered with us, and then we partnered with Do Detroit, which is a racial justice organization um, in the city of Detroit, to create a training, very, very specific training um, for emergency department providers to talk about racial bias in the emergency department among patients with opioid use disorder. So very, very targeted. That training was piloted last fall uh, among a group of physicians at Henry Ford Health System. Um, And so New Detroit, I know, is taking a look at the evaluation results and, um, you know, deciding next steps with that, how to expand that training, um, how to offer to more providers. But that is part of their Just Care Institute that they have. So looking at trainings like that. And then I also know that the state recently added the requirement for implicit bias training among all providers as well. Well, I know you can't walk us through the whole training, but I think it would be really valuable if you don't mind touching on some of the stigmatizing language that is, you know, no longer acceptable in this space. Maybe a healthcare worker, just a member of the general public is listening and doesn't realize. Uh, I know that there's a lot of terminology that is frowned upon in, in the world of substance use disorder. So I would love if you could share some of those. I would say addict is definitely a big one. Um, I don't know if folks still use terms that go as far as to say junkie or things like that, but obviously we don't want to to use that kind of language. Anything that, you know, similar to how we are looking to use person first language in a lot of different spaces, especially with different healthcare conditions, you know, that same advice applies here. So um, it's not an addict, it's someone who has an addiction. It's someone with a substance use disorder are probably some of the biggest ones. For folks who might not be as familiar with like why we're saying medication for opioid use disorder versus medication-assisted treatment, medication-assisted treatment or MAT is a very common term, but the kind of the shift away from that and to MOUD instead is that by using the phrase medication-assisted, it's implying that medication, you know, can only really be used to assist other forms of treatment. But really we know that while counseling and everything is very, very beneficial, we know that there is just medication on its own can be beneficial. You don't necessarily need counseling to see a positive impact in your treatment. So moving away from that to say that medication on its own 
can be sufficient for some folks in terms of treatment. Um, that's again, not to discount counseling or anything because it can be very important, but. I know other terms as well, such as clean and dirty are no longer acceptable either. So if somebody does have a positive test, for example, on a urine drug screen, you would no longer say, well, you're dirty right, you would indicate that you had a positive screen. Um, or a clean, right, would indicate that you previously that you had a negative drug test or a negative drug screen. And so utilizing those terms positive and negative versus clean and dirty because Otherwise, it feels like you're associating them with being clean or dirty, and that's obviously not appropriate. We have some really wonderful resources that are from other organizations that we do tap into. Um, the National Institute on Drug o Abuse Words Matter course is really wonderful and kind of helping you navigate appropriate language, again, person-centered language that we should be focused on. And additionally, Superior Health's Shine a Light on Stigma campaign they have a wonderful resources available through them. You can actually sign a pledge and indicate that you yourself or your organization is going to sign is going to stand and shine a light on stigma and work against stigma. So um, I think both of those organizations really have strong lists that kind of help you navigate some of the narrative that you should be utilizing in your daily life. Yeah, I appreciate you both bringing that up, and I'll of course include links to both the resources in the description of the episode. Um, I think that language is just such a huge part of stigma and the way we talk about it kind of defines our perspective on it. So, and Michelle, I just want to also call out the point you made earlier that it's not a moral failing if you're struggling with substance use disorder. It should be treated like any other physical or mental health condition where you need support and treatment and recovery looks different on everyone. So I just want to say that again. So I guess my next question is just what resources are available for hospitals who are interested in EDMOUD programming? There are, there are a lot. Um, so some of the resources that the, the MOP has available right now um, are some recorded trainings um, that we created last year that kind of divide up the entire process. So if you were starting from scratch, uh, you wanted to work in your emergency department to help stand up one of these programs, everything from like the basics of EDMOUD down to like, how do you champion this work to how do you engage other providers like nursing and then kind of talk about like the outpatient landscape or spreading it to inpatient. So those trainings are available. Right now, we do still have technical assistance available um, through our team of clinical providers. Um, again, completely free for any hospital in the state that wants to take advantage of it. Uh, that can be one-on-one -on -one TA. It can be holding in-person group trainings at your hospital, whatever, whatever's needed. There are also a ton of different protocols already out there that exist and lots of different guides. Um, guides that could be anything from what is the appropriate like dosing protocol um, if you're administering this to what are the appropriate billing codes um, and reimbursement processes. Um, and so we have a toolkit on our website that kind of tries to aggregate a lot of the resources from the different, different great organizations out there. But a lot of those resources are actually from um, California Bridge, who I think currently is going a little bit under a little bit of a rebranding. So they might be known as the National Bridge Network by some, but they actually started, um, they started championing this work uh, a few years ago out in California. And I think they're working with most of their hospitals now. Um, so they're, you know, one of the national leaders in this space. Um, I know they provide technical assistance as well, um, but they have a lot of really great protocols and guides that I know our clinical team and a lot of the hospitals use. The American College of Emergency Physicians, or ASAP, actually has a lot of some different trainings and some different protocols um, on their website as well. MyCares is, is, a, is an LMS, um, or a learning management system, that's led by um, a physician um, here in Michigan, and uh, it kind of takes folks through the addiction medicine path. And then uh, U University of Michigan also has a research for, uh, for Opioid Institute. Um, and they also have, I know, some TA and some trainings on there. So there's lots of different resources. I probably didn't list them all, um, <laughs> but there's a lot of them are aggregated on our website. So if you go there, you can you can navigate to most of them. Right. And as mentioned before, I'm going to include links to everything that's mentioned throughout the episode um, for anybody who's interested in learning more about the programming or how to get involved. Um, Michelle, is there anything that you would add to Marissa's initial list of resources? 
Yeah, Marissa had a really inclusive list. I think the only additional one I would add is uh, Michigan State University is also working to implement uh, with the MHA Keystone Center what's called the HEART Initiative, which is really focused on implementing inpatient-based MOUD services as well. So that will allow for more continuity of care, if you will, if you are admitted in, in from the emergency department and initiated on MOUD, those will then continue as an inpatient. If you come in from the community into the inpatient, setting, again, they'll be able to continue those services as an inpatient. And so that's also really critically um, important for the success for those in recovery. Absolutely. I know the continuum of care is foundational to this work, so I appreciate you sharing that. One of the questions I, I didn't get a chance to ask earlier, just hearing how many hospitals have adopted this programming, have you received or heard any anecdotal feedback from, you know, healthcare workers, patients, really anyone um, who's benefited or seen the positive impact of this programming? I wonder, Marissa, if it would be helpful for you to speak to some of the results that came out from Bloomberg, because I think some of those those specific bullets talking about the program implementation between, I think, October of 2020 to September of 2021 really resulted in some fantastic outcomes. I don't know if you want to speak to that, Marissa. Yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, so, yeah, like I mentioned previously, um, we work very closely with Vital Strategies on this initiative. Um, and so they have helped coordinate a partnership with Johns Hopkins, um, Bloomberg School of Public Health, who have been um, evaluating this initiative. And so the first um, evaluation came out last year, I think it was now. Um, but yeah, I looked at the time period between October 2020 and September 2021. At the time, um, I think 19 hospitals were participating. So those are the ones that were included in the evaluation. And what, what Hopkins found is that over the course of the grant period, all of the participating hospitals increased their use of buprenorphine and connected more than 500 patients to follow up behavioral health care in the community. And then about 50% of the hospitals participating reported administering MOUD to 450 individuals in the ED and provided 250 follow-up prescriptions upon leaving the ED. Overall, every hospital saw greater provision of buprenorphine, improved screening processes during patient intake. They expanded their networks of community-based providers to facilitate those warm handoffs. Um, and they brought in their ability to monitor patients even after the, uh, leaving the ED to ensure care continuity. And we continue to work with Johns Hopkins. They are currently looking at, uh, they're trailing the process of doing another evaluation for the following year. And um, while the previous evaluation focused really heavily on like qualitative data for the most part, this next one is focusing pretty heavily on quantitative data. So very excited to see those, those results come out soon. Yeah, that is definitely exciting. And I know both pieces are really important. Obviously, quantitative data is a wonderful way to measure success. I just know when it comes to this work that anecdotal feedback can be really priceless and profound. Um, Michelle, were you going to say something? Yeah, I just wish we had a couple of our clinicians on with us because some of their stories and their very personal stories of treatment that they've been providing mm -hmm. have been so impactful for me personally to hear about uh, you know, one of them had a patient come back almost a year after they were initiated on MOUD. And they came back and were like, I'm now married. I have a kid. You helped me get my life back on track and look at how successful I've become. And I mean, I can't even imagine how he felt in that moment because all I felt was a sense of pride and accomplishment of like, look at what we've been able to accomplish by offering yeah. these programs to our hospitals and having them implement this. This is so meaningful that you can make such a difference in in anybody's life, right? And so uh, those stories are so wonderful. And so I'm really looking forward to hearing, you know, more coming from this next evaluation period. Yeah. I mean, I'm sure many of those patient stories speak for themselves and really in the most profound way, demonstrate the impact of the programming. So on that note, Michelle, I do want to make sure I ask you if we have, you know, hospital or health system leaders listening or members of the community or Michigan patients or lawmakers listening, how can we as, you know, a state <laughs> protect and support this type of programming so that it stays in Michigan hospitals and continues to help Michigan patients struggling with substance use disorder? Yeah, absolutely. I think 
Transparently, unfortunately, the funding for this program is coming to a conclusion. And so we're really right now focused on sustainability of the efforts that have already been implemented with our hospitals while we continue to seek additional funding to be able to continue to expand this effort. So I know that the MHA Keystone Center, as well as at CSFEM, are really focused on making sure that we can continue these efforts. We are dedicated mm -hmm. to ensuring that we are supporting Michigan hospitals and people of Michigan to have access to these important and critical services. Mm -hmm. And so as, you know, as Brian Peters, who is our CEO, always says, advocacy is not a spectator sport. And so what that really means is that you know, you have a great opportunity to contact your legislatures or your senators and speak with them about how you feel about the implementation of these programs, that you want to see these services available within your community, that you want to see peer recovery support specialists available within your community. And, you know, they have the ability to have conversations seek funding. Um, as you may be aware, there are a lot of dollars coming into the state of Michigan currently from the opioid settlement funds. I, I know that we are very hopeful that we might be able to tap into some of these resources, but you being able to speak up and sharing how important you feel this will be for your community, um, I, I think that will go a really long way because frankly, I don't think I've met a single person that has not been affected in some way, shape, or form by somebody that has had a substance or opioid use disorder um, or somebody that has experienced the impact of the opioid epidemic. And so these services are really meant to be in place to help help support those. And um, being able to speak up, voice, voice the need, the desire um, is going to really go a long way to ensure that we can continue to support our hospitals and making sure that these services are available to everyone. Absolutely. Yeah. That advocacy piece is so huge for programming like this and making sure that it stays vibrant and continues to help people. And substance use disorder, I think it's been mentioned multiple times throughout the episode, it really can Im impact and does impact people at all walks of life across all communities in this state and throughout the country. Um, and I just imagine there are definitely going to be people listening who feel inspired to get involved uh, or implement the programming within their own organization after hearing from the two of you. So. I really appreciate you both taking the time to be here today. Um, Marissa, I want to make sure I also ask you if if there's any other, you know, pieces that you're working on related to this and, and anything you want to call out from the CFSEM standpoint. There's a lot of um, amazing programs. I guess the one thing I would call out is that the, the Community Foundation and the MOP really tries to, you know, plug in to, to assist in whatever way. The community needs and wants and can benefit the community. So one of the ways we tend to do that is through convening folks and helping to build peer-to-peer -peer relationships and um, cultivating networks. I do want to plug that I'm very excited to be able to pull together all of our champions who've been working on this um, project the last couple of years um, at our upcoming symposium this September. So we'll be able to, again, pull um, many of the partners that we mentioned and, and more. So we certainly were not able to, to, to mention all of them, but they will all be there on September. September 18th and um, lots of the champions who have been doing this work. And so to some of the points we made earlier, we want to not only build those networks, but also assist folks with how they can strengthen and grow their program. So if they do have, um, you know, their MED program set up in their emergency department, they can um, look to see what other harm reduction resources that they can offer any, again, to Michelle's point, um, how they can really pull in peer recovery um, support services into their program, how they can bridge this into the inpatient side of the hospital, because that is so cr critically important, and, and some additional topics as well. But so that symposium will be really great. And then I also just want to point out that we, one of the other things that the MOP supports is post-overdose rapid response efforts um, or quick response teams, as some folks um, may, may call them. So we, we supported a handful of teams um, a couple years ago um, through um, a grant partnership with Blue Cross Blue Shield and um, MDHS. And those grants have since ended, but we continue to pull together teams from across the state at these quarterly convenings. And some of the things that we've learned just in this past year is how closely some of these post-overdose rapid response teams work with the emergency departments. And so 
really excited to continue to build those connections um, through our quarterly convenings, but hopefully also through the symposium. So I guess just to bring it full circle that this work is not something that we could ever do in a silo. Um, and I think something that's so at the heart of this work is collaboration and partnerships. Um, so that's why you'll hear Michelle and I mention many, many different individuals and, um, and organizations and lots of different convenings um, and hope to have more moving forward. Yeah, that's wonderful. Uh, you touched on harm reduction. I want to call out that October 28th is National Drug Take Back Day, a really important initiative that gives families and individuals an opportunity to safely dispose of prescription medications, whether they're expired or unused. You want to get those out of the house safely. And that is one of the controllable risk factors when it comes to substance use disorder. So we'll include more info in the episode's description, along with the many other resources we've mentioned, but just wanted to call that out. Uh, Michelle, is there anything you would add on the Keystone side based on what Marissa shared? Yeah, I'd like to to certainly shout out Blue Cross Blue Shield of Michigan, who has additionally helped to fund um, some expansions into academic detailing, which is peer-to-peer -peer, um, technical assistance and coaching that's offered. And so really through academic detailing, we've been able to launch a specific module for EDMOUD as well as for inpatient MOUD. So those individuals that are really interested in implementing those programs, this would allow you to train individuals who would help with that coaching and implementation support at your home organization. So um, a huge thank you to Blue Cross Blue Shield for helping to support that really important work. And again, continuing to, you know, make sure that they're heightening the awareness of the need for this services across the state of Michigan. Yes. Thank you to our friends and partners over at Blue Cross. Um, it was mentioned earlier, but that collaboration piece is absolutely critical to the work that we're doing in this space and in a lot of areas of healthcare. So um, I want to thank you both again. I think, you know, we're so fortunate to have people like you who are clearly very passionate about the issue and the topic uh, working in this space. So I really appreciate your time and um, I, I hope that we can connect again and hopefully down the road, we'll have more stories to tell about how impactful this programming is. Thanks so much for having us. Oh, thank you. With that, I'd like to thank our listeners for tuning in and encourage you to check out the episode's description to learn more about EDMOUD programming, the MHA Keystone Center, and the Community Foundation for Southeast Michigan. If you or someone you know needs help for a substance use disorder, we also included linked resources and the 24-hour treatment referral hotline. Thanks for listening and have a wonderful rest of your day. Thanks for listening to the My Care Champion Cast. To learn more or get involved, visit mha.org.